Welcome to the Old Capital Real Estate Investing Podcast with Michael Becker and Paul Peebles. During this program, you will hear interviews with real-life successful investors who will share their stories and provide useful advice on how to acquire, finance, and operate apartment complexes. Now, here they are, Michael Becker and Paul Peebles. Welcome to the Old Capital Real Estate Investing Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Peebles, National Underwriter for Old Capital. And joining me today, the mayor of Beckerville, USA, Mr. Michael Becker. How are you? Hey, Paul, doing good. How are you? Well, just we're getting excited because coming up September 14th and 15th is the Old Capital Conference. Old Capital Conference in Dallas, Texas. We're going to be right next to the Cowboy Stadium, right next to the Texas Ranger Stadium at Texas Live. So we would love to see you there. And uh, it is a great networking opportunity, great educational piece, great opportunity to find maybe other limited partners. Or if you're a general partner, if you're a general partner, find other other vendors or people that you can do business with. And Michael, what's your two cents on telling people about the old capital conference? Yeah, look, looking forward to it as uh, as always. It'll be a bunch of, uh, you know, several hundred of our closest friends out there and sure. people that actually go out and, and uh, do do the thing, you know, whether they're limited partners, general partners, or a lot of the, the multifamily brokers that sell the sell the deals that we all want to buy or we'll, we'll be there as well, which is a little bit unique compared to a lot of these other conferences I go to. So yeah, definitely recommend it. And how, how do we get tickets, Paul, if they want Again, to come oldcapitalconference.com, oldcapitalconference.com. And the guest that's with us today is also going to be at the Old Capital Conference. So our good friend, J.P. Conklin with Pensford, the real estate interest rate guy. He's telling us about what's going on in the marketplace. You want to listen to JP and the guys over at Pensford. So Pensford.com, he's the guy. So Mike, I'm going to kick it over to you and let's talk with JP Conklin about what's going on. JP, I'm sure most people probably know who you are, but maybe give uh, the the short version since you've been on our, our show several times, but maybe kind of a short background on yourself and Pensford. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm JP Conklin, the founder of Pensford Financial Group and I spent my entire career working with commercial real estate firms around their hedging strategies. So going on 20 years, which is a little painful to say out loud, <laughs> uh, the last 13 of which have been at Pensford. I started that uh, out of my own house about 13 years ago. I'm looking forward to the conference. I assume it's okay for me to wear my Eagles jersey and, <laughs> uh, and I'll get a free ticket in as long as I'm doing that. Is that fair? Uh, probably better for you to wear the Eagles jersey in Dallas than me, the Cowboys in Philadelphia. So uh, <laughs> maybe <laughs> fair, fair enough. So, well, cool. Well, um, so I guess really the reason why we'll have you on is kind of uh, get a little state of the market. It's been choppy or volatile to say the least the last, uh, you know, nine, 10 months here as we are in August, as we record this and recently just had the, uh, the, the July fed meeting. So kind of what's the, uh, What's your takeaway from the from the July Fed meeting and kind of kind of where what's, what's your uh, read of the the world right now? Yeah, I mean, just as you guys are probably seeing extreme volatility, own um, rates are up twenty plus basis points. If you look back, sort of seven eight years, that's an extremely rare, and this is just kind of the world that we're living in now. So, FOMC, the main takeaway was that the Fed is going to keep fighting inflation. They are only focused on inflation. And so the takeaway for everybody is don't worry about what the jobs report says. Don't worry about what stocks are doing. Don't worry about earnings reports. None of that matters until the Fed has broken inflation. And so that's part of the reason why the market is so pessimistic about a soft landing, because normally by now, the Fed would have changed its tune. It would have said, you know what, we can start to ease off the brakes a little bit. Maybe we'll reduce it to quarter basis point hikes or every other meeting or something. They don't have that as an option right now. And compounding that is the fact that month-to-month inflation data still appears to be accelerating. And so it feels like it's supposed to be peaking, and yet month-to-month, it's still going up. So the next two months will be hugely important to determine where we go the rest of the year because the Fed will get two CPI reports before the next meeting. And I think that in general, what they're looking for is sort of three consecutive months of trend data to say, 
we've leveled off, we're starting to come back down, maybe we don't have to be quite as aggressive. As it stands right now, the market is sort of split. The, the base expectation for the September 21st meeting is 75 basis points again. So that would put us up around three and a quarter. I would say there's a 50-50 chance after that of 100 basis points or 50 basis points. We'll see how this data comes out. They have proven to be responsive to that data. So even though the data might come out just a week before their meeting, if it shows positive signs, that might sway them to do 50 instead of 75 or 75 instead of 100. But they are not yet out of the woods. They cannot yet stop aggressively hiking and sending signals that they will keep hiking because the minute they do, they'll give some of that ground back that they fought so hard to convince the market they're going to break inflation. So you say that, but then I was looking at July was the uh, most best month of the stock market since 2020. Seems like there the market was also priced against some rate cuts, uh, not only pausing, but rate cuts in 2023. So how do we kind of square that circle where you're telling me they're going to be aggressive, another 75 or 100 in September, another 50 or 100 in whatever that November, December, whatever the, the, the final one is. How do we square that circle with the stock market raging and rallying back on, uh, on, on the expectations of lower rates in 2023? Partially because the first six months have been so brutal for stocks that it's just bouncing off the bottom. So it, it's easy to have the best month in a long time if you're just coming off of the bottom. Number two, you're right. The market is starting to price in some Fed cuts next year. And so generally speaking, the, the higher the inflation data, the more the market believes that the Fed is going to have to hike even higher which will then result in even faster cuts back down at some point. Like I, the, the visual I have in my mind is like a roller coaster, right? And every time this inflation data comes out a little bit stronger than expected, they're just still climbing that roller coaster up. And then once it breaks, it probably means they're going to have to backpedal that much more, that much faster on the other side of this. Right now, the market thinks that's middle of next year. And so what are we seeing? Uh, how's the impact of the last handful of uh, uh, months uh, had on rate caps. So obviously, the rate caps have been been going up. The the, the market expectation of the in actual reality I got paid out on a couple of them for the first time in my career here recently. So we haven't just actually set money on fire for, for a change. Uh, I don't know if I, I appreciate that or not, but um, you know, I just got paid on some some rate caps here. You know, the the expectations were were you know, and the, and the cost of these were were extra uh, extraordinary. In kind of your May, uh, May and early June timeframes, have we seen those kind of the premiums of these kind of calm down on, on average? And again, explain yeah. what a rate cap is for people that may not know who that is. Sure. So, a rate cap or an interest rate cap is just a ceiling on your floating index. So most loans now close with SOFR as the index, and you just want to make sure it doesn't get above a certain level. Let's say three percent, three and a half percent. You pay an upfront premium for that insurance contract. And if SOFR ever gets above that level, the bank reimburses you the difference. So you have a known worst case scenario. To Michael's point, these costs have been spiraling out of control for the last eight months. And so they have become very cost prohibitive over the last eight months. We finally saw prices leveling off in June. And then over the course of July, they actually backpedaled. And so up until today, (laughs) one-year caps were down maybe 20% over the last two or three weeks. And depending on the strike, some two and three-year caps were down as much as 40%. So it was a huge correction, which unfortunately today has now backpedaled uh, and they've gotten more expensive again, but at least they have stopped spiraling out of control. That will be also determined by what we see with inflation data going forward. Because if we can see continued inflation, inflationary pressures, Fed's just going to be stuck. They're going to have to keep hiking. And that means a 3% cap will just provide that much more protection. And that means it's going to be that much more expensive in the interim. So what's your average premium on say like a two-year uh, two year cap? Are you seeing like 2% of the loan amount? Uh, is there there's some, I know obviously it depends on your strike, but what are you kind of generally seeing out there right now? Yeah, so it is very strike dependent. If you look at, let's say a $25 million dollar, 3% two year. It's probably around 290 grand, maybe just around 300 grand. If you stretch that out to three years, it's more like 450 grand. Um, okay. So you're about 2% if you do a three year, maybe yep. one and a quarter on, on a one. two year. Uh, yep. 
Okay, so then that where was that like in the peak in kind of late May, early June? <laughs> over two percent and probably over three percent. Yeah, it seems like uh, definitely seeing those those kind of come in. And to your to your uh, your view of the world, kind of where we sit today. If I'm looking at doing a deal, I got a five year hold period. Would you? Uh, where's kind of your crystal ball on float versus fix? Would you float it by the cap, or would you uh, take a, a five year deal with a yield maintenance defeasance? Kind of today, it, yeah. I mean, if if I'm still holding for the full five years, if I don't expect to leave this early, and again, I think part of the dynamic that we're not accustomed to right now is people might be closing on loan terms that are not favorable, not as favorable as they they once were. And so, to me, I think I actually believe that the odds of prepayment or refinancing are much higher than they used to be for someone who would otherwise be a five year holder. Right, they might just be. I just need to get what I can get. I'll refinance this a year or two from now. If that's the scenario, I still go floating and buy a cap, and I just probably shorten up the cap term as much as possible. If I'm truly five years, I think five years is relatively safe because to fix because the curve is actually going to be inverted. The, the floating is going to be more expensive than fixed for probably the next year or eighteen months. And so, if I'm really holding that. For the full five years, the fix provides a level of safety as we enter these sort of uncharted waters that the floating is not going to provide. Bloomberg came out two weeks ago and said they think the Fed's going to have to hike rates to 5%. You know, locking in for five years takes that off the table, right? You might give something up on the backside. You know, I, I believe that rates will be back down at zero at some point three years from now. You'll miss out on that. But what you do take off on the table is the upside in the interim, you know, 5%. And then eliminate that hypothetical scenario where maybe you miss out on rates going back down. Yeah. And plus you save the cap cost on the front end. I guess you probably have to factor that in yep. to uh to your overall decision. Mike, uh, Paul, um yeah, just ahead, a real question for Mike is that um uh, for people that just don't know, you know, really what's what's the difference between an adjustable rate and a fixed rate in your mind with overall costs with having a fixed rate versus an adjustable rate? Because again, let's say if you're a newbie coming to multifamily, you, you just think well, adjustable is adjustable and there's there's no prepayment penalty on that. And fixed rate is just fixed rate and there's no prepayment penalty on that. What's the difference? I, don't, I would always take a fixed rate. Right. Yeah. So the if in the residential mortgage world, that would be the be the answer more times than not, because those loans are prepayable at no expense when these commercial mortgages they tend to come with either yield maintenance or defeasance prepayment penalties, which is a formula. So if you have a rate and then uh, and then all of a sudden the bond rates fall and uh, you want to go prepay it, then your prepayment penalty can, can skyrocket exponentially. And the longer the, the term, the more that is impactful. So, you know, fun story was in 2016, we we're buying a deal in Mesquite, Texas, and we were smart to you do a bunch of 10 year fixed rate money. And then we found you could do 12 year fixed rate money. And uh, we thought that 12, 10 is good, 12 is better. So we put a 12 year mortgage on this deal. And uh, we awarded the deal right in October and we weren't rate locked and then Trump got elected. And then I think the 10 year went up around 80 basis points in five minutes. It seemed like it was a matter of about, you know, two, three, four weeks where, you know, it's kind of death by a thousand cuts every day got a little worse. And we finally were able to rate lock 80, 90 basis points higher than where we, we, we originally thought we were going to be. And then uh, we go out and then of course, you know, the rates which came went back to zero basically. And we sold the deal last year. So we had it for about four or five years, had about seven years, about five years, about seven years left on our term. And um, and we ended up eating a 23% prepay is what it ultimately ended up being, Paul. So 23%, 23% come yeah, on. 23% really? of the mortgage balance was was uh, you know, still made sense to sell and we made made a bunch of money. But you know, if I would have paid an extra point or two and floating along the over those five years would have cost me 5% and then and would have been a hell of a lot cheaper than 20% plus prepay end up eating. So it's not a no brainer. So I think if you are going to fix today, maybe, maybe uh, look at your duration. Maybe you can get a, uh, it's probably cheaper to fix 10 years than it is five years. Cause as JP mentioned, the yield curve is kind of inverted. So your five-year rate is actually the five-year treasury is actually on top of the top of the 10-year treasury. So you probably actually save money if you, did a 10 year initially, but then it could cost you on the, on the back end. So I think, you know, if you're, if you really want to fix it, maybe five to seven years, probably be 
something to consider over a 10 or 12 year 12 year mortgage just for uh for that reason right there i mentioned well you you put you put your money where your mouth is you guys just recently closed a transaction in dallas was that a, a, an adjustable rate that that had took, took a floater bought a 275 strike to your cap i think i can't remember exactly what we paid it was a 46.4 million dollar mortgage if i remember and we paid like 700 a little less than 700k so probably about a point and a half, maybe maybe a little less than a point and a half. That was last week or, you know, uh, uh, end of July. So end of July 2020 is when we we did that. We bought that through JP's firm at Pinsford. So um, now you have it, a new deal. You have a new deal that's getting teed up right now. Yeah, uh, and we're debating float or fixed on yeah. it. I think the plan is to float, but uh, it's going to be a, a Fannie Mae. So I'm trying to see what a five or seven year options going to look like if we did fix it. Cause I think you, you know, it'd be like two fifteen spread to float over so far. I could probably get a one sixty five, one seventy spread. If we fix it over the five, seven or 10 year index, it should be around the same. I'm waiting on that actual quote as we talk, Paul, but I think, so do I save the 40 basis points and fix it? Plus I save the two points or point and a half on the upfront rate cap and then, and then have to escrow to replace the rate cap. Which is you know going to be expensive to you know at least at least a, a big use of cash along the way. Maybe we don't actually have to buy the the right cap, but we're going to have to impound it, and that would be a use of cash I can't then distribute out to the investors. So we're we're playing that uh, uh, the kind of the what if game right now and modeling out different scenarios as we speak in real time. So that's a uh, that's a conversation that that's very timely. So JP, you know, in the big picture, things starting, you know. Next month, month after, a couple months, six months from now, nine months from now, you think interest rates are going to continue to rise. And if you have, you know, SOFR right now is is what? What's the uh, what's the SOFR at right now? Term SOFR is around 230. Uh, overnight SOFR is around 228. So 230 is the index. You add right now four, four and a quarter, four and a half spread. And that the spread is kind of the fixed rate portion of the interest rate. The SOFR is the adjustable rate portion. That's the thing that can change up and down. So if you had four and a half plus the, you said 230 on top yep. of it, that's a real number that on a 25 or $30 million, even a $5 million loan, that's a pretty high interest rate. But you feel, or what you see is that, you know, you can chart it where we think interest rates on that SOFR are going to be going down to, so talk a little bit about, you know, how do they how do they make these projections, you know, next year, the year after, the year after that? How do we really know or how do we what's our best guess that we think interest rates are going to be coming down? So we definitely don't know. <laughs> it's everybody is wrong all the time, most especially me. I think that it's based on a couple things. Number one, that we're seeing a true slowdown, even if it hasn't necessarily hit the labor market yet. And I, and I think we might see that on Friday when we get the next labor report. But other than that, like lots of things have slowed down considerably, such as you're seeing the stock markets, earnings getting crushed, people, companies starting to lay people off. It is happening, right? It just takes a while to, to filter through. So, so the market generally believes the Fed is going to hike so much that they will put us into a recession and then we'll have to backpedal at some point, which is essentially the pattern that we always see. So this is not brand new. This would not be an outlier case. This is how it always happens. And we had gone back and looked from the time of the first hike to the first cut on average is just over two years. And the longest ever is just over three years. The market is saying now, basically, that two-year average is too long because they're hiking so much faster than usual. And that means they're going to have to cut much sooner than usual. And so I think that's why the market is pricing in the way that it is and saying, you know what, this is coming back down second half of next year. It's going to be more expensive. That 680 rate that you talked about will be a point higher here in the next three months, right? Like it's going to be 780 within the next three months. It's going to be much higher. The question is how quickly does it fall back down dramatically? So, I mean, the 10-year treasury is coming down. I mean, it hit 350, 355. All of a sudden now it's at 260, 265 or so. Yep. What, what's the projections on the 10-year treasury and and now we're going to have long-term rates are going to be lower than short-term rates by significant numbers. Yep. So and that we've been dealing with an inversion mostly since about April 1st. 
The 10-year Treasury popped back up 20 basis points today, so we're up around 275 right now. Basically, the 10-year Treasury is the market's forecast for the overall health of the economy over the next 10 years. And so what it's suggesting is, hey, I know floating rates are going much higher, but I don't care. I would rather take 275 for the next 10 years because when you start cutting, you're going to have to cut back to zero and rates are going to be below 275 pretty soon. And so I'm willing to earn less than I could otherwise for the next year or so, because I really think years two through 10, the 275 is going to look pretty darn good right now. So you're dealing with this inverted yield curve, and, and we always send out this uh, email blast whenever you can fix lower than you can float at and say that's actually historically been the worst time to lock in a fixed rate because it's the market telling you floating rates are going to be coming back down. And when you're on the backside of this curve, you might wish that you had rode it all the way down to zero. That's my, Mr. Michael Becker at 23%. We <laughs> the other day. But, uh, expensive lesson I, I paid for. That was an uh, expensive education we paid for, that's for sure. School of hard knocks. Uh, a lot more than uh, my my uh, eight-year college degree I had from uh, a 2.7 <laughs> GPA or whatever I graduated that's with. That's Dr. Becker to everybody, <laughs> Dr. Becker. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about, about volume. I mean, we always kind of check everyone's volume, whether it is a realtor about what's going on with the market today, or we talk about the lenders about what's going on. Are you guys, I mean, since you guys do a lot of adjustable rates and you do a lot of say bridge loans, what's your volume look like today versus what it was six months ago and what's your projections in the future? So December of 2021 was our busiest month ever. Year end is usually our busiest time of year. And this past December was our busiest month ever until July. And out of nowhere, July, we had our busiest month ever. If you look at it from like a new acquisition standpoint, volume is down. It has not fallen off quite as much as I expected. It's definitely down, but it's not totally silent either. The, the sense I get is deals are still closing. There's still equity that wants to go to work. Everything is way harder than it was six, eight months ago. But we also benefit from customers using seeing this volatility and saying, I want to talk about proactive hedging strategies. So they might be calling us saying, we want to hedge the entire portfolio at this point. We want to take that Bloomberg forecast of 5% off the table. Let's get something on the books now, even if it's just for a year or two, kind of get us through what we think will be the, the most painful point. And then we're also staying busy from springing caps, where the lender requires a cap to be bought if SOFR exceeds a certain level, let's say 2% all of a sudden, a bunch of those are getting triggered. And so people have to go out and buy those caps right now. So yeah, I mean, our volume has not fallen off as much as I would have expected from an acquisition standpoint. Um, and then overall, we're actually the busiest we've ever been. Yep. That's, uh, that's actually a little less, uh, surprising to me too. I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect that answer. Are you still seeing a lot of refinance business? Is that, is that up? I know the banks were all busy. Um, a lot of the, the, the balance sheet banks, your life goes kind of your more blue chip type lenders were, were all super busy and the agencies were zero and the debt funds were pretty much on, on the sideline. So have you, did you see a bunch of bank and life go business here recently? No, I would say the banks seem to be more conservative now than they were three months ago. So we're seeing less of that than we have been. I think maybe one of the things that's sort of bridging the gap from a volume standpoint is extensions. That people yeah. who would have otherwise sold or gone permanent are now saying, I gotta kick the can down the road. Let me do a one-year extension that comes with a one-year cap because they're really just trying to get to the other side of this because the lending appetite is just not there. And whenever we talk to customers about, should I do long-term fixed or should I do floating? I always stress to them like, I worked and lived through the financial crisis. Like to me, Doing a loan that is, let's say, 10 years fixed, if you really think you're going to be in it, is as much, if not more, about taking that refi risk off the table because there's no guarantee lending appetite will be as strong as it is today. And I think just we as an industry maybe got a little complacent the last sort of five, seven years where lenders just kept getting more and more aggressive. And so we just sort of thought, well, it'll always be on the table. And then overnight, you know, <laughs> you know when, when I was down there, Speaking to uh, to your your crew that you guys had out there, and you guys pointed out how valuations were down ten percent in thirty days, right? Like 
that was eye opening to me because then I know exactly what the ripple effect is going to be for the lenders. Not only are they going to be back off, but they're going to back off even more in terms of LTV um, levels that they're comfortable with. So that to me would be one of the things I would say to people is when you're considering fixed versus floating after we get through this cycle, one of the things to always keep in mind is what do I think lending appetite might be? Is this as, as aggressive as it's ever going to be? And if so, that to me is an argument for long-term fixed. Mike, you're an active uh, operator in this market today. You're always talking with the uh, bankers and brokers and everybody that's in the market. I mean, what's your take about what's going on right now? I mean, how difficult has it been to try to find debt? And again, you work in a little bit of an unfair com- advantage just because you've done so much business. You're a known commodity. But even for guys like you, what's the what's the two cents? Yeah, I know we were we we're putting a deal together in April and May. It was an up leg of this 1031 we had. And it was, I mean, it was tough. I mean, we eventually got a quote 58 levered, which was exactly what we needed for this deal. But we had another deal we were trying to work a month earlier. We needed about 63 levered. And we thought that would be no problem in kind of late March, early April. We started working on this other deal that we ultimately didn't go forward with. And uh, I mean, shoot, we couldn't get 55, Paul. I mean, it was it was tough. And then every day was you know, you know, kind of reminded me of, of when Trump got elected, that kind of time period or, or back to 08 when I was a banker. Every day got a little bit, a little bit worse. So I know a lot of the banks and, and life codes are just getting very selective. So there's plenty of 50% LTV money out there, but you get to 60, 65, you know, those are getting a little tougher. And, you know, I don't think there's really a whole lot of 70 or really any 70 levered money out there of, of, of note. Um, and everyone's, to JP's point, is, uh, you know, being very selective and pulling back on their risk profile. You know, the analogy I, I use kind of like when I lived through it in 08, because I was in junior high school during their RTC days. So I didn't get to, I didn't get to live that firsthand. Um, just kind of got the war stories from all the old bankers, but you know, it's kind of like a faucet, right? It's real, real quick to the, the liquidity got turned off real quick and then it's kind of slow to turn back on, you know, but it could shut off overnight. It's kind of what we have been through. And I'm starting to see kind of the trickle come back out from the standpoint that, you know, we, we, on our last podcast, we talked about the Fannie and Freddie are starting to, starting to become more active. It's a combination of these pricing, the pricing of the deals have come down with the cap rates expanding. You're seeing the interest rate pullback um, in the 10 year from kind of the peaks and and when was that like May or early June to kind of where we are today, you know, 70 plus basis points off the, off the peak. Uh, you're still seeing continued uh, fundamental performance uh, of the multifamily assets where the rents are growing. You're seeing some of the expenses kind of get cut back with the property taxes, at least some taxes, that's a big deal. So some combination of that soup is making the agencies get more competitive where like they weren't even getting to 50 LTV back in April or May. We're seeing 60 in the 60s, kind of mid 60s, I think, is, uh, is is attainable today. I don't know if you've done any here lately, Paul, or if JP's sitting in those kind of come, but I think we're starting to see them uh, get back into the, the the game, which is great for our industry because it's a backstop to the multifamily industry that you know office and industrial and retail just don't have. Yeah, I would tell you that before we started the podcast, JP and I talked for just a little bit about what I was seeing out there. And I was telling him about a transaction that we worked on in the mid $60 million range. And there was, you know, it was looked at by, I don't know, 60 different lenders that looked at the deal. And out of the 60 different lenders, a lot of them were at 27 million, 28 million, 29 million, you know, below 50% leverage. On the deal, there was one lender that stood up and said, yeah, I'll give you the higher leverage around, you know, 65 or so leverage. So I was just thinking, is that, you know, the smartest guy in the room that the rest of the dummies couldn't get to? Or is that the stupidest guy in the room? And the rest of those smart guys uh, knew kind of knew where the market is. But I would probably tell you that, uh, you know, a lot of the banks have pulled back. And so working, I guess, we're, and I'm going to put a self plug in working with guys like at Old Capital that have many different options to to bring that transaction to is going to be helpful in a, an environment like this, where you may just look at the lower leverage and think that's what the, it's really going to be. Or do like Mike is like his last transaction or the one he's working on right now, is that you were able to get the higher leverage in the deal and, and able to get it done. Because the, the biggest concern is that when you get that lower leverage is, is that, you know, where it was 
eighty percent last year, or a year and a half ago. Now it's down to sixty or six, less than sixty or so, or sixty-five. You got to bring a lot more equity to the table on this deal, and people are just concerned about you know I, I had no problems putting a hundred grand last year when the stock market was up and up and up, and I now I feel a little bit poorer. And I you know would you guys accept fifty thousand dollars or seventy five thousand dollars? I don't know if I can do go with a hundred. So, I mean, I, I just think it's going to be a little bit more challenging to raise capital in the future. And so, yeah, but I, I'm starting to see some green shoots. I mean, I don't know uh, how you see. We we talked about that a little bit on the the last, last podcast, podcast we did. I mean, I'm starting mm -hmm. to see kind of the water finding its level a little bit with the, the the valuations. I think you know the market's expecting some rate cuts at, at some point, so we might be back in the bad news is the good news camp yeah. uh, at some point. And you know, the CPI is complete bullshit in my, my mind where, you know, they take the owner equivalent rent instead of actual rents. And they're saying, you know, rents are up, what, five or 6% within that index, or it's really 15, you know, or something like that. Sure. I mean, it's, uh, uh, so I think there's, there's uh, still a lot of, a lot of strength within the better markets, right? Your Sunbelt markets are, are still pretty damn strong. So I think it's just a temporary disruption. And I think you know, those that have, the stones and moxie today to go put a deal together at the the reduced prices will be rewarded in in the future, especially if you can get the spreads to kind of compress a little bit. So sure. or you can refinance out. So if you get a agency loan a two hundred spread instead of a four hundred spread with a debt fund, and uh, you know so far goes from what two thirty to three hundred to zero, and then you're, you're paying two percent. Like you know we had a, several of those loans we put on 2018, 2019. That kind of spreads uh, sub two hundred, and those those deals absolutely printed money throughout uh, throughout COVID. And now we're, you know, maybe kind of uh, having to deal with that a little bit with the caps. And I don't know if it's better to have a cap or not have a cap nowadays with the with the impounds the lenders are making you put on them. So I don't know. It's kind of a double edged sword. But I'm seeing. Sorry, Michael, I'm seeing, you sold me. I'll put more money into these deals. <laughs> I've seen some green shoes, right? So I think it, again, it's very specific i think if you're in you know a tough location with an older asset you probably still got some more pain and capitulation for that to wash out of the market i think these brand new class a deals i mean all these institutions are penciled down so these deals that uh you know we were chasing we chased a deal over in in town fort worth and bed center uh, i think the broker back at february when it was out was thinking kind of that mid 90 million and then the guidance went to like low 100 million and it traded all cash at 110 and like close in seven days. And, uh, you know, those, those types of buyers are just, you know, pencils down because uh, they're all group think. And so some more scrappy entrepreneurial groups like ours are getting shots of these deals that, that we would have uh, had a, a lot more competition, at much better um, valuations and not that long ago. So, I mean, call me crazy, but I think it, it is time to be selective and, and start picking your stocks, I guess. No, I, I agree. We meant JP, to interview JP, not me, but uh, JP, no, anything else to add to that? You, know, you, you, you brought up one thing that is probably too early to be thinking about because there's probably not a lot of term sheets you know, coming across a potential borrower's desk. But as we move forward and as borrowers have options, keep in mind, if you're closing on a floater, what does the floor look like? Because when rates are screaming higher, nobody cares about the floor because it'll be in the rear view mirror next month, right? But there will come a time a year from now where <laughs> we might see it going through the floor and bars are going to get frustrated saying, oh, well, how come my floor is at 3%? I thought I was going to be able to float back down to zero. So just keep that in mind. You know, uh, that, is, that is a great point because I just have seen that recently where it used to not have a, be a problem when we were talking about sulfur at 0 0.05. And then all of a sudden we're we're coming in at two point three, and they're making the floor at the fully indexed note rate of the deal, yep. which is I'd say five and a half percent, and the, you can't go below the five and a half percent number. That that's a great point, and hopefully you can work with your broker, you can work with your lender to cross that out, and uh, put in you know the floor being as low as you can, and that's what the uh, the spread is would be the floor. And we've worked with borrowers over the years who will go back to a lender who may push back and say, no, we're not getting rid of that. But there are various mechanisms to either get it lower or get it removed by offering something in lieu of that, right? Because a lot of times the floor just translates into uh, interest income hypothetically in the future. And if you say to them, hey, listen, what if I you know, paid you an extra hundred grand 
in fees for the closing. You can allocate however you want if you lower that or got rid of it. A lot of lenders will at least listen to those discussions because they'll say, you know what, that's a hypothetical interest expense item versus upfront cash right now. I'll take that number and get rid of it. And it ends up saving them way, you know, 10 times that over, over the course of the loan. Interest rate conversation about that. People forget about the downside and how much money you can make when those, those interest rates will go down lower than what they are right now. Michael, any final words for, uh, for JP at all? I oh, appreciate uh, appreciate the the uh, always uh, the willingness to hop on the podcast and come to Paul's conference and uh, so we definitely appreciate uh, look forward to seeing seeing you here in about a, about um what are we about a month out now Paul so I guess yeah about, about forty five days uh, we'll see uh, JP in Dallas Texas at the Old Capital Conference in oldcapitalconference.com. get your ticket for that so you can meet the legendary. JP Conklin. Hopefully it won't be 105 when he comes still. But, uh, right. maybe. If it is, I'm not coming. I'm, <laughs> I'm doing a Zoom call. <laughs> that sounds great. All right, Michael Becker, thank you very much. JP Conklin, thank you. I'm Paul Peebles. Have a great day. Thank you, guys. See ya. Thanks for listening to the Old Capital Real Estate Investing Podcast. Please join us at oldcapitalpodcast.com to sign up for our weekly email updates. We'll see you next week for another great interview.